It's estimated that the number of people who play games, whether that be PC, console, tablet, or smartphone, will surpass over 3 billion this year. That's almost half of the world's population. So what is it about games that we love so much? When we talk about video games, we often talk about what games are to us, or what they do to us. Why do we play games? What's the point? Do games make us more prone to violence? Do games make us more prone to distraction? What we often don't talk about is what video games can do for us. And how games for many people can be an incredibly useful tool to help manage the symptoms and struggles of their neurodivergency. What's even more interesting about gaming in conversation with neurodivergence is that just like the gaming industry, those benefits aren't one size fits all. So one of us is going to have to change. Right now, there are over 50,000 games on Steam. Some of those games might provide amazing tools to support neurodivergent brains, and some of those tools might not be right for some people, and that's okay. Like Eric. Eric is a tool. Eric is a tool that I'm going to use today to help keep your attention and illustrate my points. Isn't that right, Eric? Over and over and over, the research shows us that when properly and appropriately used, games can provide incredible tool sets for the neurodivergent brain. When we talk about ways to support our neurodivergency, I really like to use the word tool because when you think about tools, tools are morally neutral, right? In the hands of a talented carpenter, a table saw can be a really useful and productive tool, but in the hands of someone less trained, it can be really dangerous. My arms are tired. Oh, we got it. Okay. And that's why it's important to understand how to appropriately use the tools that we have and the games that we have in order to support our neurodivergence. Hi everybody, it's me, Katie Asaurus, and welcome back finally to my channel. Today I am super excited because we are going to be talking about topic that is. I'm excited because today we're going to be talking about gaming and neurodivergence. In particular, the benefits and strategies that neurodivergent people can gain from playing games. Also, just in case you haven't met him yet, this is Eric. <laughs> Eric is the co-host of Infinite Quest Podcast, which is where we talk about ADHD, depression, relationships, and navigating life as neurodivergent adults. So if you're not listening yet, you should. Okay, get out of here. <laughs> This is what I deal with 100% of the time. <laughs> Neurodiversity is a concept that acknowledges the natural variations in our brains and says that those variations should be respected and celebrated. Understanding these differences helps us better support individuals who learn and process differently than the majority. Some of the most common neurodivergencies are ADHD, autism, dyscalculia, dyslexia, Tourette's, OCD, but there's a host of others. And just like there are a wide range of gamers in the world, neurodivergency affects a wide portion of the population. In fact, some studies estimate that up to one in seven people in the entire world are neurodivergent. That's a huge section of the population. While the focus of this video is on how gaming can support our neurodivergencies, it's important to remember that our deficits do not define us. Working to find ways to support our various neurodivergencies just means that we have more time to do the things that we want to do and embrace our creativity, our passion, and our excitement for the things that we like. I also think it's really important to talk about our new sponsor! <laughs> Geek Therapeutics. That was really good. Geek Therapeutics is an incredible organization that offers evidence-based certifications to clinicians, social workers, professionals, parents, teachers, and students on how to use geek culture to provide therapy and communication skills to unlock the best version of their clients and themselves. Geek Therapeutics bridges the gap between geeks and therapists to create practical and innovative therapy sessions that anyone can implement in their practice. And I want to be very clear, this is not just for therapists and professional. This is for parents, teachers, guardians, anybody who might want to use the power of geek gaming and general nerdery to understand their loved ones better. They've got books about parenting geeks, teaching geeks, 
relatability through memes, how to be a good DM, and so much more. And if you need direct help, you can use their website to locate a certified geek therapist based on your geographical location. You can also schedule with one of their licensed certified geek therapists online. Their experts provide comprehensive psychological services for not just geeks, but everybody. Also, they gave us a discount code. Use code InfiniteQuest to get 10% off your books, courses, and downloadable materials. Visit geektherapeutics.com to learn more. Let's talk about failure. <laughs> Eric told me to keep making a mean face. Failure sucks, but it's a big part of life, and sometimes it's important to practice failure, and games are an incredible way to get a few reps in. One of the primary benefits of building resilience through failure practice is that it can help to develop a mindset of growth rather than limitation. For example, you might notice that I'm reading a lot of this off of a script, and that is because after trying and failing over and over and over again, I realized that I was setting myself up for failure by trying to convince myself that I could just do all of this off the cuff. But I have ADHD. I need to organize my thoughts. I need to think about what I want to say ahead of time. And and so my failure practice allowed me to get into a growth mindset and I said, hey, you know what? I'm just gonna read some of this off of a script and that's okay. Failure happens, but by embracing it as a natural part of the learning and growing process, we can develop more courage to take more risks, try new things, develop more creative problem solving skills and persevere in the face of obstacles. Now you might be thinking, what's the big deal about failure? Failure happens all the time and that's true. True. Failure does happen, and it's absolutely normal to be adverse to failure, but many neurodivergent people have a special relationship to failure. In a world that isn't built for us or the way we think and process information, it can be really easy to assume that we're the screw-ups, that we're inherently bad or inherently flawed, and that's just not true. Recent studies show that neurodivergent kids receive up to 10,000 more negative messages about themselves growing up, and that can take a toll. Many neurodivergent people struggle with failure. Not that we fail any more or less, but the emotional reaction to failure can be far more significant. Because for neurodivergent people, it can be much easier to internalize the idea that, oh, I must have done something wrong, or oh, it must have been my fault, or oh, I must have misinterpreted those social cues again and made a fool out of myself. And so failure can become a thing that we fear and avoid. But failure is a natural part of life. Games can provide a safe space for players, neurodivergent or not, to practice failure and work through emotional reactions without the real-life consequences that can come with them. In many video games, you are encouraged to take risks and try new things, and failure is often a natural part of the learning process. The Dark Souls franchise is notoriously difficult, and games like Elden Ring are known for their high level of difficulty and their emphasis on trial and error gameplay, which can encourage you to practice failure and learn from your mistakes, which is exactly what the game wants you to do. One reason games can offer this safe space is because they're literally designed with failure in mind. In Elden Ring, you are often thrown into difficult combat situations where you have to learn to read enemy attack patterns, dodge attacks, and manage your limited resources effectively. Failure in these games can often mean death and the loss of progress, but you're given the opportunity to learn from your mistakes and try again. Every time you respawn, you apply what you've learned and improve your chances of success. Now, this isn't unique to Elden Ring. In most games, you are given multiple lives or respawns, which allow you to make mistakes and learn as you go. Most games even have difficulty settings that can be adjusted based on your skill level, which allow you to gradually build your skills and your confidence. And honestly, Winning is fun. You know, beating the boss, solving the puzzle, beating your best time on Rainbow Road. It's impossible. I don't believe it's possible to finish Rainbow Road. Video games offer a sense of accomplishment and validation for gamers who may not experience these feelings in other areas of their lives. When you overcome challenges and achieve goals in games, you're often rewarded with positive feedback and a sense of progress, which can help build self-esteem and confidence. Now, anyone who has played a game before knows the absolute emotional wreckage that can happen when you make a mistake or die just before you get that dub. 
But our reaction to that, whether it be stepping away from the controller or throwing it through your screen, relies on our ability to regulate our emotions. Emotional regulation is the ability to manage and control one's emotions in response to different situations. Games can have both positive and negative effects on your emotional regulation, depending on how you play and the content of the game. Video games can be an incredibly useful tool for teaching emotional regulation skills. Many games involve challenging situations that require you to stay calm and focused, which can help you learn how to manage your emotions under pressure. Additionally, games that involve cooperative of play can help you learn how to communicate effectively, manage disappointment, and work together to achieve a common goal, which can be really useful for learning how to manage your emotions in social situations. Speaking of Elden Ring, on May 2nd, Geek Therapeutics is launching their new Kickstarter for their book, The Psychology of Elden Ring. They go more into detail on some of the topics that we're going to talk about today in the video and more. So if you're into Elden Ring, if you know somebody who's into Elden Ring, or you just want to learn more about how to apply geek topics to your psychology practice, check it out. So we're practicing failure, which is great, and we're learning how to regulate our emotions while doing it. But what happens when you just hit that limit? Just like real life, video games can be super frustrating, even too frustrating. And many, many neurodivergent people, especially people with ADHD, struggle with something called frustration tolerance, which is a person's ability to manage and cope with frustration. This includes the ability to keep your cool, persevere in the face of setbacks, and maintain motivation and effort despite obstacles in your way. Even if those obstacles are a boss fight or something in real life, you know, like you're running five minutes late to work and then you hit every single red light on the way there and then the person in front of you is driving 35 miles per hour in a 55 mile per hour zone. So and then a goddamn tornado comes out of nowhere! Games can be a great tool for building frustration tolerance, even when it's to learn when to set the controller down, take a deep breath, and go eat a snack. Do we have any Cool Ranch Doritos? Let me check. Nope! And honestly, Sometimes a game might be too difficult. Sometimes life can be overwhelming. We can't adjust the difficulty settings on life, but gaming gives us an opportunity to practice feeling frustrated and navigate through those emotions safely and in a controlled environment. Now, we've talked a lot about emotions and how they relate to gaming, but there are so many more things going on in the head of a neurodivergent person. Just like games can be a training tool for working with our emotions, games can also be a great way of supporting our executive functions. When we talk about executive functions, what we're talking about is your brain's operating system, the processes that run in your head to get you through the day. Executive functions are a set of cognitive skills that are responsible for planning, organizing, initiating, and completing tasks. Executive functions also include things like time management, working memory, attention control, emotional regulation, flexible thinking, and they're really important for success in school, in work, and in general. Think about a couple of your favorite games. Do you have to manage multiple missions, gather resources, manage items, navigate the world, make quick decisions? I'm willing to bet that in quite a few of the games that you've thought of, those mechanics are a core component of the game. They're also a core component of how our brains work. Games can help build skills to support our executive functions in many ways. First, many games require you to set goals, plan, and organize tasks effectively, which can directly transfer to real life. When we're confident that we can organize multiple Minecraft inventories or run an entire city on city skylines, we can transfer that confidence to organizing our refrigerators and running our lives. 
Did you add running or organizer or refrigerator? Because that was really good. Video games can also help to improve working memory and attention control. Many games require you to remember and recall information quickly and accurately, which can help improve working memory. Additionally, games often require you to pay close attention to your surroundings and react quickly to changes, which can help improve attention control. If that isn't enough for you, video games can help improve flexible thinking and problem solving skills. Many games require you to adapt to changing situations and find creative solutions to problems. For example, puzzle games like Portal require you to use logic and creative thinking to solve complex puzzles and to innovate creative solutions to in-game problems. Again, something that you can directly transfer to the real world. Have you ever taken a look at your to-do list and gotten instantly overwhelmed? Or maybe you keep trying to will yourself to get up and do the dishes, but for whatever reason you just can't make it happen? There's a word for that. One of the biggest struggles for neurodivergent people, especially people with ADHD, is task management, task organization, and task prioritization. It can be super difficult to manage multiple tasks at once, organize the order in which you want to get something done, or even just know where to start. Games often require you to engage in task management and prioritization just to progress through the game. Many games offer quests and objectives that must be completed in a particular order to advance the storyline or unlock new areas. Others have an open world format where you have to prioritize which tasks to focus on based on your preference, their importance, their difficulty, and the potential reward. What is particularly interesting and I'm genuinely excited to talk about in this video is that Minecraft has been scientifically proven to be an incredibly useful tool in developing task management skills in kids with ADHD. In Minecraft, you are given a virtually infinite world to build in and explore. You're absolutely free to build and do whatever you want, but to do so, you have to make a plan that starts from breaking your very first block. Oh, I didn't, I didn't write anything for this. Was I supposed to? I made this hat, though. So. You can also do what I do and just Leroy Jenkins straight into the fray, but either way, you have to get stuff to do stuff. And that process of gathering resources can be time consuming, but it requires planning, organization, and you got it, task management. You don't start the game with fully enchanted netherite armor, you gotta chop a couple trees first. And this isn't just a Minecraft thing. Many games offer you limited resources like health, ammo, or money, which you have to manage carefully to ensure that you can progress through the game without running out. Even simple games like Mario Kart have an element of task management and prioritization to them. In Mario Kart, you have to balance speed and risk taking with strategic time management in order to win races. One of my personal favorite games, Mini Metro, is all about task management and prioritization. You have to build a subway station in real time without letting the stations get too overcrowded. Also, Kia Toto, if you're watching this, huge fan. Sorry, I got distracted, back to Minecraft. Minecraft offers a ton of features that can help you work on your task management and prioritization skills. For example, you can use the game's crafting system to help create tools and weapons that make gathering resources more efficient. You can also use the game's inventory system to organize your resources and tools, making it easier to find what you need when you need it. Or you can all just put everything in the same box and just hope for the best. That's what I do. <laughs> Minecraft can also be used as a collaborative tool to develop teamwork and communication skills at the local and SMP level. You can work together on large building projects, dividing tasks and coordinating efforts to ensure that your project is completed on time and to the highest Minecraftian standard possible. Ask anybody on the Questcraft server, we get stuff done. Now, gaming by yourself has its benefits, but like we see in Minecraft SMPs, one of the biggest and best things about gaming is the community we gain along the way. One of the most overlooked things that games can provide to the neurodivergent brain is simply a frame of reference, common ground, a means of communicating in which everyone involved knows exactly what everybody else is talking about. Think about Minecraft. 
redstone circuits work a certain way. For example, traditional redstone random value generators are made by using a dispenser which outputs randomly from its inventory slots to alternately fill and drain hoppers which feed back into the dispenser with one stackable item and one unstackable item such that a comparator taking an output from the hopper would randomly output a redstone signal strength of either one or three since its output is dependent on the percentage filled the hopper is rather than the number of items in it. First try. That was first take. Thanks. Nice. That was me. I wrote that section. Now, if you don't play Minecraft, you might have absolutely no idea what I just said. I play Minecraft and I don't either. But if you do play Minecraft and you do really enjoy doing redstone stuff, now you know that we speak the same language and we have common ground. That in itself can be a powerful tool for overcoming many of the social and emotional struggles that can come from being neurodivergent. MMORPGs, the metaverse, and even online community games like Second Life offer valuable opportunities for players to develop and improve their social skills through online communities and multiplayer modes. By playing games online and with others, you can engage in a variety of social interactions that can help to build social skills and develop new relationships. Even more than that, many multiplayer games require you to work together to achieve a common goal, which can help develop skills like cooperation and problem solving and even project management. Do you remember during the lockdown phase of the pandemic when games like Among Us and Fall Guys became really popular? All of those games are built on the same idea. Social interaction with a shared experience as the common goal. Even casual play games like Jackbox are an incredible way to stay in touch with friends and family over long distances while still doing something at the same time. As much as some incorrect people would like to dismiss online relationships as somehow less than IRL relationships. Studies show over and over again that these connections that we make online are real, serious, authentic friendships. Take a few minutes to scroll through YouTube and watch the hundreds of gaming friends meeting in real life for the first time videos. These friendships are real and authentic and it's really beautiful. Some people play together for years, even decades, and form lasting friendships and even lasting families. Also, this aspect of gaming as communal is literally historical. Listen, it would not be one of my videos if I didn't find a way to shoehorn some type of history into it. People have been gathering to play games since prehistoric times. The Royal Game of Ur is one of the oldest playable board games in the world, and it originated almost 4,600 years ago in Mesopotamia. You've also got Wari, which is also sometimes called Mancala. You've got Senate, Dice, Card Games, Sogoroku, and the Indian game of Pachisi. Before we had video games, every culture from every part of the world found a way to build community playing together. And that aspect of community was literally built into how we play games still even today. The first really popular video games like Pong and Computer Space weren't played at home. They were arcade games. Arcade games were and are a popular way for people to socialize and compete with each other, and the physical presence of a giant cabinet made it easy for people to gather around it. The arcade cabinet replaced the gaming table. There were over 10,000 arcades in the 1980s, and there are still around 2,500 active arcades in the United States today. But you didn't just go to an arcade to play games. Arcades were part of the social landscape. They were in malls and bowling alleys and amusement parks, places where people would go. You would find games there that you could play and watch other people play together. It was like the first Twitch. <laughs> you didn't stay home to play games, you literally couldn't. It wasn't until 1977 when the Atari 2600 rose to popularity as one of the first in-home consoles, and it wasn't until 1985 that the NES began the real transition from social arcade gaming to in-home gaming. Listen, I'm neurodivergent and I will put deep dive hyperfixations into my own videos if I want. Now, it is important for me to know, because I know some of you are already running to the comments, 
arcades are not dead. They're actually having something of a resurgence as fans of specific games and the arcade experience have met and united online. In fact, in some ways, the transition of games to an online experience has given players the ability to meet, connect, and share the experience together, which often results in circling right on back to real world experiences. Conventions like Gamescon, PAX, C2E2, and more bring in hundreds of thousands of fans every year. The rise in popularity of these conventions and release events allow real life meetups for fans to engage, gather, discuss, and share their passion for their favorite games, which has led to a massive growth in fan spaces the world over. Communities also beget communities. Many games have their own smaller communities like cosplayers or fan artists who step in to champion their favorite games, and players have even become prominent figures in the community themselves. There are so many more things that I want to talk about when it comes to neurodivergency in gaming, but I promised Eric that he wouldn't have to edit anything longer than a 20 minute video today. So to wrap up, when used appropriately and intentionally, games can be an incredible tool for developing skills and working to support neurodivergent brains. They can help us with regulation, social and emotional learning, time management, practicing failure, and to develop real and meaningful relationships in virtual and real world spaces. So now I wanna know, what games are great for your neurodivergent brain? What skills and talents have you developed as a gamer? Let me know in the comments below. Also, just really quick, Thank you all so much for watching. This video is really special because it marks a big transition in my content. Not only is this the first partner video that we're doing with Geek Therapeutics, which is an organization that we are so thrilled to be working with and we're so passionate about and the work that they do is so important. This video also kind of marks my grand transition to YouTube. I'm still gonna be on TikTok. I'm still gonna be posting on TikTok, but I did a lot of soul searching um, in the first part of the year and I realized that TikTok is no longer really a platform where I can educate and advocate the way that I want to. And so moving over to YouTube is definitely scary, um, but I hope you like the video. <laughs> Speaking of that, don't forget to smite the subscribe button. And if you want to hit the bell and do the like thing, you can also do that. If you liked this video and you are interested in this topic and you want to learn more, I have compiled an extensive bibliography of the real studies and the real research that went into putting this video together. And so I have linked that in the description below if you want to check it out. Speaking of links down below, Eric and I will be running games that you can play with us this summer at both Convergence at Evermore Park and then also D3 at Sea. I'm going to be running three indie games across three nights and we're going to do a lot of collaborative world building and storytelling and I'm really Really, really excited. So if you want to come play games with us, you should. We'll also be doing guest appearances this year at Gen Con, PAX East, and a few more. So don't forget to follow us on our other socials as well. And all of that information is in the description below, or you can visit katiasaurus.com for more information about tickets and how to join us playing cool games on cool boats. Again, a huge thanks to our new sponsor, Geek Therapeutics, and don't forget to check out their Kickstarter for the psychology of Elden Ring. They're gonna be breaking down more of the ideas that we talked about in the video. We'll post links to all of that stuff in the description below, or you can visit geektherapeutics.com for more information. All right, everybody, that's it for us this week. Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you all so much for being here. Don't forget to listen to Infinite Quest podcast, and we will be back next week with a new video, so stay tuned. Bye! Did we get it? Bacon and footage, right? <laughs> yeah.